Theme song for the Gear Podcast. Yeah. Welcome, Leon. We're back. Welcome, Troy. We are back better than ever. How you been, mate? Did you My- have a good weekend? You were you were doing the Dockers. The Dockers won. They won. So I've been in a good mood. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was my son's birthday party, so that was cool. And, uh, yeah, otherwise, man, just, just living a, living a life. What about you, my brother? I was in Melbourne for the weekend, mate. So making noise, you know, that was good fun. I, I, I was wrecked yesterday though, you know, people who know me know I don't partake in anything. I don't drink. I don't like drugs. I was just really, really tired because I flew across the entire continent twice in about 24 hours. So, mm. uh, the show was really good. Um, they, I mean, it was over, I think they, there was about 200 in pre-sales. So, it was probably around 200, 250, mm-hmm. which is, uh, we played the Prince Band Room last year in about August. And that was, that was tough to get people out. It was just post-COVID. So, we got like a decent turnout for that. But yeah, we got about- that was about double this time, which is pretty awesome. And Sweet. You know, the Sisters Dolls guys are great and they had the rotating drum kit and all that kind of stuff happening. So, Rad. that was pretty fun. Uh, caught up with some mates. I thought we played pretty well. Played Sky's Limit for the first time. Did you it was butcher good. it? We did. We, no, no butchery. It was actually good. Good on you, mate. It's like, and we did Letting Go, which we've never done before, which was also very, very good. Nice. I was watching the video back as well, and I was like, oh, when I went to do the solo, like my high E string was just detuned by a semitone. Wrong. Oh. I just I just started a fret too low. There's a bunch of things because I, I played my blue custom 24 and, you know, it's got 24 frets. There was a bunch of times I was just off. Right. Which you shouldn't be. I've played that guitar for a million years. It's unacceptable. So, right. yeah, there were a few few nuggety bits, but overall it was a pretty good vibe and caught up with some friends in Melbourne on the Saturday. And then I was back Saturday night, had a gig Sunday, did a bunch of stuff yesterday and, mate, here we are. Here we are. And um, so, how about your mates, the West Coast Eagles? Feel pretty good about that or what? It's, it's funny how the tide has turned, hasn't it? Yep. A week ago- they were still getting flogged. They still had the injuries. Mm-hmm. They just hadn't lost by 171 points. Biggest loss since 2011 for any team. And, pretty good. And what was that oh, no, team sorry, that biggest, lost? That was the, uh, the, the first 200 uh, plus point loss since um, or 200 point game since 2011. Um, but biggest loss since forever. So, yeah, Melbourne was the team. I think Geelong v Melbourne. Was it like Mark Neal era Melbourne as well? Like the absolute- mm, I don't remember. Bottom of the barrel. Like you've had Fitzroy. Yep. Then you've had that Melbourne team. Mm-hmm. And now you've had this West Coast team. Yeah. I mean, like North was for the last two years. North have been pretty bad too. Pretty yeah. rubbish. North have been pretty Fitzroy. But yeah, they, they weren't getting pumped by 170 points. Yeah. I, I, um, I was really rooting for Fitzroy back in like 95 because they were so shit. Do you remember that last game? Yeah, yeah, they played the Dockers, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, flogged them as well. Yep. And it was so, like, I think maybe you sent me that recently. You're like, oh, you check this out. And it's just weird after the game, hey. Mm. Like, well, this is it. I absolutely Club's watched done. it live that year. Yeah, um, me, uh, me too. I remember it being like, oh, my God, they're gone. Do you know what? Like, I think in my brain, my, um, like, I reckon I'm a year off in terms of how tuned in I was to football. Right. I always thought it was 95 that I, I was like super into it, but I think it might have actually been 96. Yeah, I think n- ni- 1996 is the first year I properly remember in my life because I remember writing the dates at school on every piece of work I ever did. Mm. I and, rem- you know, no. other stuff happening, but yeah, <laughs> Port Adelaide came in in 96, right? No, nah, later than that, 98 maybe, I think. Really? Sure. Yeah, because Freo came in like 95. Yeah, Freo th- were 95. I know that. I don't think Port was 96. I think it was like 98, I think. Okay. You can check that. But um, well, well, And they almost this a, made- This is the, a fact almost, accurate podcast. We'll get to it. They almost made the eight in their first season. I think they finished ninth, which would have been like- That's right. If, had they made the eight, it would have been a pretty big deal. But And I liked Port back then as well. And then I hated them. And I, I kind of like them this year. I'm really- Man, Port Collingwood Grand Final would be sick. Well, my old man, who's a diehard Magpie supporter, if, you, if you're a- team that's a magpies or you're black and white he'll support you mm-hmm. he's he's rooting for that because then that way you know he can't lose because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's port adelaide magpies versus collingwood magpies yeah 
Yeah, when they, did they uh, the when did they come cup. into the competition? I really I really want to know. I really want to know. They were founded in 1870. Yep. I love how they have their we are the most successful AFL club ever. Mm-hmm. They're just like, yeah, count all these sandful premierships that we've won. Yeah. So that's uh Proud pretty history. crazy. Proud history, Port. 97. Yeah, see, oh, okay. I'm off by a year as well. They there came go, into mate. the AFL. So, Both there off. we go. Ladies and gentlemen, the Gear Pass podcast, Ooh. the Gear Pass. <laughs> well, mate, mate there's that say- new PRS guitar out. You know, the, there's a, well, there's two, isn't there? There's the Miles Kennedy and the, what is it, the NF-53? 53. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, on that note, you know, we'll talk about that, but you wanted to sort of talk about, like, refined classics, I guess you could say. Yeah. I think you could say that. I think you, you, just, PRS, I, you did just say that. Your PRS, your SIR, your what other, what other companies, your Duesenbergs, you know, these kind of companies that I guess have take, taken classic guitar designs and just made them a little bit better, yep. a little bit more good, and what, kind of built their reputation around it. What's your feeling off the bat? You, like, yay or nay? For the new PRS? Well, okay, start uh, start with the PRS, like, and then we'll talk about just the- con- Actually, you know what? Let's start with this. What's your what's your feeling on the general idea of taking a classic instrument and like, I guess, modernizing it and making it better? Are you are you for it or are you not for it? Hundred percent for it. Okay, I think I am. I think I'm pretty for it. But yeah. um, I think it's worth a little discussion. Um, but let's start with the let's start with the new PRS because I saw that and laughed and went fuck off, Paul. Like I I, I was not into that guitar. It's a Telecaster. And it's like, I'm not into the Silver Sky. I think I- Oh, we're, mate, we, we all know about your love and appreciation for anything John Mayer, yeah. particularly that guitar. Yeah. the the <laughs> We'll talk about my other theory in a minute. But um, yeah, I thought that guitar was just super whatever. I didn't like the way it felt to play it. it to know that now there's a Telecaster like of that- I was a bit like, well, fucking, what's the point? Just buy a Telecaster. I guess the more I thought about it and I watched a couple of videos, I, I sort of came around a bit because there are things about the tellies that I have that I don't like. And, it, and to be fair, it kind of feels like they like fixed them a little bit. I think partly I just, like in my head, I'm like, if you want a telly, buy a telly. If you want a Strat, buy a Strat. Just if you want a Les Paul, get a Les Paul. And so when when you have a design that's just so clearly just ripped off something that is old, I, my in, my gut instinct is just to say like fuck off. So it's probably not that justified, but again, that's why I thought it'd be an interesting like topic of discussion for it's today. It's just the reactionary conservative within, mate. It's just <laughs> yeah. finding its way out, you know. It's like, well, this already exists. What's the point? Why would I do that? Yeah. I mean, what don't you like about a Telecaster? I think the- Well, okay. I watched a couple of the videos. Um, I think it was maybe Paul sitting and like playing it and stuff. But the, the noise issue is is a big one. Like yes. it's- I mean, I didn't really know that much about the Narrowfield pickups and they sound pretty interesting. I think the- Is that in like- You know, the Paul's guitar? Like his- Is that his signature model? Yeah, I feel like maybe in, there's one in the neck or something like that. Yeah, I just thought it was this mini humbucker, like, to look at it. And I was like, I don't really like- I'm not that frothing on mini humbuckers. But if it's more of a, like, kind of single coil, but, you know, you've taken the noise out. Like, you get that sound, but take the noise out. I'm like, well, I'm kind of interested in that. So, you know, little things, like, that's kind of the, the biggest the biggest one for me, I suppose. Um, I really like- I mean, this kind of flies in the face a little bit of what I was about to say, but it's like, um, I think I messaged you about this maybe a few weeks ago with a, um, the Charvel Telecaster. I actually kind of came, I hated it the, the way it looked at first, but I come around that as well, where I do really like the way tellies feel and I like the body shape. Um, but, you know, it's got like, I think it's the same on the, the PRS one, but like there's body contours on it as well, which is just comfortable to play. Um, and Fender do make a telly, like a modern telly with- like a tummy cut, right? I think they do, yeah. So, I guess I kind of like, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've sort of like come around to the concept of maybe tellies being a little bit more refined, but I don't know. I just, just something about the PRS ones always just like instinctively make me go, fuck you. <laughs> it's kind of silly. Yeah, so, my, I guess my take on it is 
like their single cut, you know, if you like the way a custom 24 plays and then you go and play a Gibson, it's different. Mm. Different is good, but maybe you want it a little bit more like your custom 24 or your, you know, 22 or whatever it is, whatever sort of model you're playing. So there's definitely that thing where it's like, I like this, but I want access. I want the same feel and I want the same level of, you know, refinements, mm. whether it's the way the frets are dressed or whether it's less noise from the pickups or whether it's straight string pull on the headstock or, you know, all these like tiny little incremental things that do make a difference and especially cumulatively make a difference. So, you get that kind of like, I'm used to this type of guitar and, you know, I played a real Telecaster and it's cool, but I, there were things that I didn't like about it. If I can be, if I can get that sound and maybe a little bit of that aesthetic while still being in that universe of like a PRS or something like that, then I guess that's why they're making it. Yeah. I think like, okay, so um, partly why I came around to the the new PRS telly thing is I'm sort of, I guess like searching for the perfect gig guitar. Um, I've, I've sort of done that a little bit. Um, I played my 335 at a gig the other night. Oh, oh actually, yeah, uh, the last two weeks I played it. Uh, I did it for a, like a four piece rock gig or covers gig. And then for a duo gig um, for the, for the covers rock, rock thing, it was really awesome. I used it all night and sounded great for the duo gig with all the loops and the way I use it. It just wasn't quite the right feel. Um, but a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it was tuned down to D standard and it did not like yeah. that tuning. So there's one. Um, secondly, the pickups on it are really hot and everything was dialed into my telly, so, which was quite low output. So everything was a little too grunty sounding. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, it, I was just sort of like, we were a bit pushed when we started. It was pretty much like, you know, everything that's plugged in, just start the gig. So I didn't really have time to, to dial the tone in um, when I was there. So it didn't really work for that. But my Jason Isbell telly, my Fender one, which I've had for maybe two years now, um, that's just become like the perfect gig guitar for me. It feels really comfortable to play. It's been refretted um, and it's had a lot of lot of work done to it. But there's still things about it where it's like, yeah, the the rock, like the grunt, I do love a grunt. And um, it has a different sort of uh, like bridge sound to it, you know. I've sort of, I remember when we spoke to Charles the other day, I, I mentioned like, I think I'm a, Super Strat guy, like in my heart, but specifically HSS because I, yeah, I right. love that single coil thing in the neck, and I love the um, humbucker in the bridge. Like that, that is the the kind of the perfect combination for me. So I'm trying to find like th that pickup combination, but with a body style and a everything else that kind of suits me. You know, like the three three five, the size of the body is awesome because I'm a big person, and I feel like when I hold it, it looks proportional. Um, I went to the music shop today, and there was like the most sick, beautiful looking purple EVH Wolfgang guitar or whatever <laughs> nice. that, that is. And I was like, oh man, that looks awesome. It'll be perfect for the Dockers games, but they're just like so small. I, I just yeah. don't really feel that comfortable playing them. You know, if it was like- Kind of telly-ish. Kind of- Yeah, but they feel kind of, way kind smaller, of not, smaller yeah, yeah. than that, you know? Like the neck's it, very narrow, I think. Yeah. That's the, and the, body the thing too. that I've noticed. Yeah. I just, I need a, I like size on it. So again, like I'm on this, like, I'm on this search for what is the most perfect guitar for me, which- it's so silly. I got plenty of amazing guitars. Like I'm very spoiled exactly. for that. But so yeah, this um, this new PRS thing. Like the more I thought about it, it's like oh look, if it's a bit more modernized. You know, it's a little bit more silent. It's got the comfortable body contours on it. Um, maybe I could kind of, maybe I could sort of live with that. It's pretty pricey though. Hey. Yeah, I think so. I mean, all their stuff. Everything is more expensive, but in particular, their core models really are. Mm -hmm. You got to spend some big dosh. Well, because so. like when the um, Silver Sky came out, I reckon that was like three and a half ish. But like in Oz, Australia, in yeah, Australia. But did you say it was more like three and a half US when it came out? Or when's, when's no, it's no, no. I think it's I think it's around the three mark. Okay, look, mate. I'll we'll we'll look this up while while we're talking about it. The the thing that I do contrary to what I was saying before about oh, you want that telly look and feel and things like that, you know. You could get like a DGT, and I get mm. I get that they're a more expensive guitar. But if you're going like super high end PRS, then that thing again, it's sort of it doesn't look like it's going to be, but it's sort of like a refined '60s Strat and '50s Les Paul yep. in one. You get some kind of pseudo telly tones out of it. It doesn't sound exactly like any of them, but it's got its own thing going on. It's very, you know, the especially the wound strings have that kind of vintage 
mm. like Les Paul grunt out of them, which is nice. When I played that other DGT, I really liked that guitar. Like that was um, that was on my sort of maybe not bucket list, but it was on my list of guitars that to what could be the perfect gig guitar. But I think like other things that I really appreciate in the perfect gig guitar for me is something that I can trash, and that's really important. Like, yeah, I and don't- you don't want to do that to like a fancy top Les Paul no. or PRS or something. Like a telly is just. Like, you know, I bought my Sir, which is, should I grab it? Actually, I've moved the studio around, so it's actually a lot easier to grab. I'll, I'll grab, chuck it up on the screen. I think I showed um, uh, Charles, but here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Troy Nabberband's Sir. I believe it's Koa, Stainless Frets. Look yeah. at that thing. If you're listening to the podcast and not watching, it's a beautiful piece of flamed Koa. Kind of a sunbursty finish. You got what roasted maple on the neck. Yep. HSS. I remember Gold when you bought it. that and just being like, "Oh my god, this is it! You're done. You found the one." But well, yeah. I mean, like, I, I think at the time I bought that guitar because I messaged you when we were in America, and like, I think I was in New York and you were Midwest, maybe still. I've flown. I can't remember where you're at, but like. We'd never seen a Sir because they just don't didn't at that time exist in Perth. No one knew anything about them, and no yeah. one would stock them. So that was exciting, and um, because we love Red Beach, and he obviously played a co Sir, it was like it was a pretty big deal. But it's awesome. But it's <laughs> that's what a great shot for those what of you that um, are listening. Uh, Leon's cat just walked across the screen, so uh, yeah, across gone. the camera. So that was very good. So. <laughs> It's um, it's so it's such a nice guitar, but it's so pretty, and I don't want to trash it. I got to take care of it, and you know, I, I'm um sort of in the process of redoing my pedal board at the moment, and I like as I was uh looking at my pedals in the light of day, and not when I just pull it out of the pedal case and do a gig, which is pretty much all I do. Like they're fucked, man. They are so messy and dirty, and they've had drinks spilled on them and, and everything. And this is stuff that like. I've had a, I've had these pedals for like a year and a half, two, some of them for a year and a half, two years, or maybe two years, and they they looked like they're about fifteen years old, um, because that's just what happens when you do a gig, you know, like when you have your stuff on the floor at pubs a yeah. couple of times a week. And when it comes to guitars, like I like I like guitars that look played. Um, yeah, so I got a couple of road warns that they they're not like hyper gaudy road warns. Um, they do look pretty okay. Um, like they just look subtly, but then I've put so many dings and scratches in them. And to me, that's like shows the love and shows the life in it. Whereas, yeah, something like a, a PRS, it's the thing, or like the really expensive fancy guitars, it's something that's kind of, um, uh, is a bit of a turn off. And, but it, yeah, it's such a signature of, of this, like taking a, an older instrument and refining it. It's like, oh, now it's, it's like more perfected and now it's shinier, it's cleaner and it's all the things that, made it shitty that we've removed them and yeah there's a fine balance isn't there yeah you know? i think like you know my um my blonde telly which is awesome that's the one that looks the most fucked up like it was pretty road oh, it was like you know medium rose wa- road worn when i got it and i've really beaten it up and it's got nitro finish on it too so it's it's worn it looks wicked uh, and it looks very very played but like partly the things i like about it like there's um the the neck to play certain things on it is real like to play a lot of chords and play sort of around the maybe first to the seventh eighth ninth fret is really comfy in the Keith Richards zone <laughs> yeah and then you when you go up a little higher it's like it doesn't have low action it's got like a um what's, what do you call it? when the radius is like seven point two five it's not it's the opposite of flat more curved radius I guess yeah it's curvy yeah curvy frets so out it's yeah it's it doesn't have that sort of like elite um shred you do anything like play anything on this guitar but that's kind of what's nice about it because it makes you just kind of like smash it harder and when i play it i just like yeah i bash it and i make different sounds with it and that's awesome and that's what gravitates me towards a telecaster um yeah it's just sort of i I wonder if when if slash when i play one of these new pair s's if i'll just kind of be like oh it's it's just nice and you have to treat it kind and i think do you want to know what it costs in australian dollars yes i do 5,500 Australian dollars. Are you serious? Yeah. So, it's about 3,000 US at the moment. So, is that for both of them, like each of them or is that- I think so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you're getting- You're in custom shop telly territory for that. 
Yeah. I mean, what did you pay for your Isbell Telecaster? Like two and a half or something? Two, two, maybe? Like, <laughs> and look, I hate this question when people say it. It's irrelevant. Is it really $3,000 better? Well, who cares? But <laughs> is it really $3,000 better? You know, uh, are you going to- I would pay $3,000 if it was better, if it was like my favorite guitar, but there were a few little tweaks to it. You get to that stage where it's like, well, every small incremental thing is just going to cost way more yep. once you get to a certain threshold. Like, you know, the first, <laughs> you know, the first month is free, but then from then on, you're on a subscription. That's just yep. how stuff is. So, yeah. But yeah, it's, I always, mean, it's always- To counter like, that- uh, go, You go on. Sorry. Go. Yeah. I was going to say to counter that, like my- PRS, my blue one, my custom 24, which I've gigged heaps. Uh, and to an extent, my McCarty, which I've also gigged heaps. And my black SC245. Man, that thing's like the top of the guitar on the side of the binding. Uh, it's pretty ugly now. And the mm. back's got heaps of buckle rash. And, you know, they're just- They've just been toured and played a lot. Yeah. And I think as you were saying, it's like if you've had a guitar for a little bit, and you've managed to preserve the kind of like, you know, how it came from the shop, then I find less impetus to want to potentially ruin it more. But once you start getting some character into it, yep. you know, it's an aesthetic thing. You can't say that the aesthetics don't matter. Yeah. Like it's <laughs> rock and roll is an aesthetic exercise. Country music is an aesthetic exercise. Pop is an aesthetic exercise. If you're taking part in these things, then it's important, you know, and like- yeah, having those having those scars on it kind of humanize it or something, or mm. you know, they 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 make you a little bit more connected to the instrument. Yeah, I mean, even if it doesn't really translate into the sound, again, it like it makes you play a certain way and do certain things because you're less inhibited. Yeah, when I watched the video of Miles Kennedy talking about his guitar, um, I think he it looks pretty scratched up and pretty beat up. Like he's toured that for like a year or something like that he right was, uh, f i mean from what i i saw online it was like the worst kept secret is that this guitar was coming out because it was like he's been gigging it you know yeah yeah um but it's kind of different like it's got his name on it so <laughs> it's he's gonna if he wants another one he'll just like call up paul and be like, give me another guitar it's sort of it's yeah different. yeah treat it probably in a different way um yeah those yeah, I still have an attachment with- Oh, not attachment. I have this feeling with poor Reed Smith guitars that they just need to be treated nicely. I think your your single cut's a little different because it's a plain black one. I think it just- Like the real, like beautifully figured maple tops, those are the ones that are just like, oh, I better be careful with that one. It just you know, has the, that the, class the, about the, it. The purple into green thing, which I personally don't love. Like I can appreciate the artistry and the finishing, but, you know- I think that's why I like that guitar because, you know, I like <laughs> John Sykes who plays a black Les Paul custom, yep. you know, and has played for ages and it's a bit beaten up. And, you know, Randy Rhodes who played a white Les Paul custom that sort of had that, you know, the paint colour had gone off. I like that aesthetic of, oh, like, I do like old Gibsons and old Fenders. They look cool. But yep. if you can have a similar vibe, but- you can have better playability and be better tuning stability. I'm all in for that. Uh, that's sort of the main, I think it's the main thing you get with say a new guitar, like say if you talk about the refined Fender thing, I feel like, you know, obviously Sir Anderson, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Uh, John Sir was a Fender master builder as well. But, you know, the thing that I like about the Sir is Fender don't make a production guitar with stainless steel frets. Right. You can get, basically any sir with stainless steel frets and mm. kind of never have to worry about having it refretted. And, you know, if you want HSS or SSH or anything like that, you can have those options on there. Mm. What is interesting is I feel like maybe the last five, 10 years, you've had, you know, the, the super strat has been around for a while, but now you've got like high-end builders that are doing those like munted fender shapes, like the offsets, mm. you know, the kind of unsung shapes, like uh, what's the company Built, B-I-L-T. They do like a kind of jazz mastery thing with a weird head sock. And, mm. you know, you're starting to see like indie bands and alternative bands play the things which I guess were just kind of reserved for these, you know, rock musicians where it's like, <laughs> you know, there's that element of like rock music where it's scum, but also it's luxury. So, 
seeing a slightly different aesthetic, more the alternative kind of scene, the high-end stuff, or even like, you know, the Duesenberg thing mm -hmm. as like kind of refined Gretsch with some fixes to it. But I think the Sur to me is still, yeah, that's like you take, it's more than the sum of the parts. Like anyone can build a parts caster, mm -hmm. but I've never played a parts caster that feels as good as your Sur or some other Surs that I've played. Yeah. I mean, I think like I almost looked at uh, my one is, um, yeah, it's just obviously a super strat. Like they do the, the way more um, traditional strat type guitars, of which those ones that I've played have been. Oh, actually, have I played those ones? Maybe I haven't. I've sort of played more of their um, standard shape ones. I didn't like the modern right. one um, when I played it, but yeah, the one that I have, it's kind of like, despite what it looks like, it's like not really a strat. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't give me that same feeling. Like when I pick up one of my strats, I have one feeling. When I pick up my sir, it just is like, um, yeah. There's that the element of like treat it nice. Uh, the, yes. the element of like it kind of makes me feel like I need to play the guitar higher as well. Um, yeah, and yeah, put, yeah, yeah. Put more touch into you. it. Um, and yeah, and also because it's got the humbucker in it, it's it can give you a lot more of that like chuggery chuggery sort of sound. So right, right, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know. I, it's obviously still it comes from a strat, but it's just not really the same. It's um, yeah, it's it, it's weird, man. Like, I think ultimately I'm complaining about nothing. I'm just, oh, I mean, that's just why we ha have this podcast, yeah, right? It's just having a whinge about man. nothing. <laughs> but um, yeah, I um, uh, I don't know the. I I think like what it comes down to for me is maybe a silly thought, but it's like. It, the I just want to try, try and say it without just sounding like a complete fucking douchebag, but like can't can't we just move on and just find a different thing with guitars? Like you know, maybe instead of just trying to reinvent the wheel, like let's come up with a new shape, let's come up with a new pickup system, let's come up with an like let's try and move on. It's um, it's sort of like. I know the answer. I know that we can't do that because ultimately guitarists are so conservative and we just want the thing that we want and that we're used to playing and we can't deal with innovation. But it feels like, what are we, like 70 plus years into the like the instrument as we know as an electric guitar and we're still trying to fucking remake like Telecasters. There must be literally millions upon, not millions upon millions. Oh yeah, well, tens of millions of, of that shape and that do that thing in the world. Um, there's surely, surely there's like actual innovation that can happen that just pushes the instrument forward and pushes the genres of music forward of which you would use that for. Um, well, like when are you going to buy a Strandberg then? You know? Like, well, you know what? There when you are you going to buy an Aristides? Yeah. Because these things exist, but I know you would never be seen dead with a Strandberg at a gig. You're, like you're, you're just not going to do that. You're completely fucking right, man. It's um, like, and they make things that are kind of like more designed for a telly kind of thing. And, you know, I've played a few. It's a thing. Like they have the Endura neck thing and, you yeah. know, it's different. They tried. Steinberger. Uh, look, I'd play a Steinberger live. 100%. That's, but again, it's like <laughs> a Steinberger is like the 80s vision of what the future would be like. Yep. Uh, and I feel like a Strandberg is like a 2020 vision of what the future will be like. But ultimately- you know, you're going to try and get the same kind of guitar sounds out of them. You know, is, does it boil down to like, to me, it's almost like approaching it like the guitar needs to change is a different question. It's like, once you've had electronic music, like everything has changed and it took maybe 30 years from the birth of the electric guitar until synthesis. And then once you have synthesis, you can just make sounds, you know, and how many, like how many modern pop albums are just, some melodic content with a bunch of cool sounds. That's sort of the, yep. I guess that's like the spirit of it and the ethos of it. And you can make those cool sounds with guitars, but yeah, it's almost like you can psych yourself out by thinking too hard about it. Yeah, maybe. Look, you're and right. Then, you know, like, honestly. And you see like, you know, who's, who's like hip in the world of electric guitar at the moment that we care. Like think of like, I don't know, Matteo Mancuso, like everybody's frothing that dude. Insane, it like, you know, plays with his fingers, fusion player. He plays a rev star, like Yamaha. Right. You know, it's not about the guitar. It's just, you just watch him play and you're like, that's ridiculous guitar playing, dude. 
cool, you know? It's not Steve Vai doing ridiculous guitar playing with, like, a universe anymore because that was, oh, my God, bro, do you know Steve Vai has a seven-string guitar? It's like, yeah, now, now the extended range guitar has become, like, a meme. Yep. I mean, it would probably, like, you know, what you said about, like, Strandbergs and this sort of stuff. I mean, this is the complete fucking counter of what I just said because I don't really like the way those guitars look that much. Um, but also, I think partly what I don't like is it it always feels so focused in just a particular genre of music and a particular sound that I'm not that interested in. So yeah, maybe, I think it, maybe that's I would say that problem. it flows the other way, that the real specific, you know, if you want to call them demands or uh, aesthetic choices that particular genres make are going to lead them to want to find a different, like, oh, you know, I'm like Pliny's not going to be, Pliny could play a Telecaster and sound like Pliny, but, you know, part of the- aesthetic is that yeah he plays a strandberg you know and like all his music videos look like an ikea commercial um you know great player but like it's it's the it's the like the zeitgeist of the youtube generation you know what i mean where it's like macbook pro and a minimalist studio setup Mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff and you know wearing clothing that doesn't have any logos on it it's it's just kind of like what I guess our generation does where or or it's you know be as commercial as possible wear like Nike and Adidas and play a Fender like they're the they're the things that people lean into and they're like oh I'm being ironic yeah cuz then I'm you can't criticize me cuz we we live in this like post everything age so yeah this the Strandberg thing to me is it looks too much like IKEA it's got that right. like nordic minimalism about it which you know it's not my favorite thing, but IKEA is pretty sick. They make stuff that I like to use. Yeah, you know what? I just the more I think about it, I don't even know what my fucking problem is. To be honest, I think I'm just I, I, honestly, I think I'm just complaining about nothing. Um, we we've got the gas Troy. That's what it is. Because you know, you mentioned the PRS CE24 a few weeks ago, and mm-hmm. I just got a DGT, and it's the best guitar I own. Mm-hmm. But like, guess what? I was looking at online the other day. I wonder how much CE24 is. That'd be cool to get. Well, so I was in the music shop this morning, and I was looking at other guitars and thinking, oh, that'd be cool. It's like, I just got my 335 back after not having it for months. <laughs> so, it's- um, You think I'd be able to at least enjoy that for a bit before I go getting on nah. gas again? I mean, it's- it. This is not a guitar or musician-specific problem. Like, if you want to see how insane people are with this stuff, like, go to a f- Reddit subthread about coffee mm. or water or anything, you know, it's- I think there's this, I think it's just what people do. Yeah. I mean, you could argue that it's it's late stage capitalism, Troy, and, you know, this is just uh, all these things are just avatars for the meaningless of our lives. Um, yeah. But also, nah, like, <laughs> you know, why, why is it that you can look basically back into human prehistory and we've always just had toys? Yeah. Oh, I, I think, like, I'm just- the more I'm like thinking about it and discussing it out loud, I feel like I'm going round in circles and contradicting myself and just realizing how stupid I sound the more I complain. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Just- uh, I mean, I'm the same because I'll be, you know, I'll make a YouTube video about, hey, everybody, delete all your presets on your Axe FX and just have one preset and play music. And the next thing I'll do, I'll edit that video and then dial in six different ambient presets that I'm never <laughs> going to use. So, um, there was, I forget what I was reading, but someone made the, whether it's I read it and someone said it or whether I read it and got thinking about it. But I think if you actually want to understand people, don't look for the things that, that, that you know, if you want to understand the way someone thinks, don't look at the parts of their thinking that is consistent and logical. Look at their hypocrisy. Like, what is someone super hypocritical about? And then you kind of understand what drives them. Right. That's interesting. That's- that's an interesting take, I think. And if you look at, if you like, if you wanted to apply that lesson to say historical figures in rock guitar, <laughs> you know, like Eddie Van Halen, I don't care about the gear, bro. I just play. Also had a signature piece of everything and was like a, a eternal tinkerer, you know, someone who had the touch, had the gift, well, like just could do anything. And they were constantly messing with their gear, yet they also always sounded the same. Mm-hmm. So, 
you know, what what's that all about? Or, you know, uh, what would another good example be from the Thai table, you know, mm -hmm. like <laughs> went from the ultimate convoluted thing to get, you know, a guitar sound with some chorus on it that sounded cool that everybody loved to like Orange Crush. But, mm -hmm. you know, you're making... You, you're making records that, like, your fans are just like, can you just do the first five albums again? <laughs> so there's there's that element in there of, yeah, I, and I feel exactly the same because, you know, the thing that makes me the happiest is making music, but, you know, spend most of my time worrying about what I'm going to use. It was like the gig on the weekend. I was like, okay, cool. going to take my blue PRS. Why am I going to take that guitar, Troy? Because if something happens to it and it falls out of the plane, I will be the least sad. <laughs> I would be sad if that guitar got like snapped in half, but I would rather it be that guitar than any of my other PRS guitars. That's the decision. That's that's like the thought process. Insane. Like, dude, just take your favorite guitar. It's probably going to be fine. Yeah. It's safer than driving around with it. I, I was looking at um, pedal board stuff last week and it was, you know, you know, you know, the type of person that has the big pedal boards. Oh yeah, and the 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 Strymans and lo like those type of guys. But I, I watched this one video, and, and you know what? Go for it, bro! Like go for it, twenty year old whopper kid. Have your Strifecta <laughs> and your Even Tides. But I'm judging you inside. I and you know that's a me problem. But I'm looking at it just going, yeah, I know what's coming next. Well, yeah, uh, like uh, the one video I watched. I think the guy was actually talking about how he was using an Axe FX for um for his gig but now he's built like a smaller rig with an fm3 and it's like it's like okay cool no worries that's fair enough like it's more portable and stuff but then it's like on like every aspect of the board it was like well on on the axe effects rig i'm gonna have this pedal and this controller and therefore i need the exact same pedal and controller and then the same like expression pedals and sort of stuff on this rig as well i'm like that's a that's a lot of stuff. But then the and then the MIDI controlling underneath it and then all the routing and the cabling and stuff. And then it's just like the reason you do it is that when you're on one stage you use one rig and when you're on the other stage you use the other rig. But then meanwhile you probably put like five, six, seven thousand dollars per per rig and you're probably gonna use them maybe once every week or once every month. And it's like what the fuck are we doing this for? You know, it's just so, it's so, like, I, I'm doing the same thing at the moment because I um, said I'm re, sort of like, I, I just bought another rock board. I bought the, the 4.2 one, the slightly bigger one, because I got the 4.1 and I'm thinking about transferring everything over for my 4.1. But then, like, I put that FM3 on the on the, the 4.2 board um, yesterday with an expression pedal. I'm like, well, that looks pretty cool. And oh, I might actually have enough room to put, like the RC500 on here and, and maybe a different Morningstar controller and then all this sort of stuff. And it's like, but then I could use that rig to do these gigs. And then I've got my other board for doing the other gigs. It's like, man, I'm doing the exact same thing. And all that's going to happen is I'm going to have a massive hole in my wallet again for no reason. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, being all of these things were previously only accessible to pros. Mm. So if you were touring and you were playing five times a week, six times a week, 10 times a week, however much it was, you needed this stuff to just bolt on and go. Mm. Like you, but now it's available to everybody, you know? Like I think about the busiest I've ever been playing music. I think it was 2014, we did the States and we did 21 shows in four weeks. We did a couple of like double ups where we did an afternoon show and a, an evening show. And it was, I, like, I didn't have any time to play guitar. Like, I didn't get to practice. I didn't get to warm up. We'd just get to the gigs. I had that PV-112-6505+. One, one mm -hmm. Had an even type. My board was a tuner, a wah. I think I had an SD-1 as a boost or, like, the way- Like, there was some pedal doing boost things that never changed. I think I had a green rhino at one stage or- It was probably just an SD-1. And then I had that even type time factor and I had two different presets on it. Mm -hmm. And tap tempo. Tap tempo was- Really, really important. Once I had that, I was like, do everything on a volume pedal. That's right. But the volume pedal would be first thing in the chain. And you that you was went from having a like, all I went was a tuner to having like seven pedals on your pedal board. But yeah, anyway. right. So, but 
it just went straight back in the bag. It got taken out the gig. It went straight back in the bag into the van. Like that was that was it. That rig got used heaps. I had one setting on the amp that I used. So I think about all the gear I've been through in the interim, and I think my rig is actually better now. And it's an FM3 and an expression pedal, mm-hmm. and it does all the same things. <clears throat> it could do so much more. Yep. You know, I could do insane stuff with it, but I'm still all. It's still the same sounds. Yep. It's like heavy, heavier and louder with delay and then heavy plus delay. Yep. Tap tempo, wah. Mm-hmm. That's that's enough. Yep. Um, even I borrowed my mate Shane's Axe Effects in Melbourne over the weekend and he's got an FC12. So, I had the FC12 and it threw me a few times because I'm used to three buttons yep. with tap and hold. So, yeah, I actually think, and I mean, that's one reason why my FM3 just stays in the case between gigs. I actually don't take it out and really play with it anymore. Mm-hmm. The The big box is for play. The little box stays there, it stays under the stairs now and it's just like gig. Yep, I know that's going to work. So, that's 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 my way of cutting the Gordian knot of gear. <laughs> but, man, I do the exact same thing. Like my pedal board- during the week, it doesn't come out. It comes out every outside of a gig. It comes out maybe every three months, four months, because yeah. I'll, I'll program a different, um, like a few different songs into it, which is really, it's only just tempo, um, like song title, tempo, and maybe a rhythm pattern on the on the one thing. Um, and then occasionally I'll also, if I've really just been hating my sound for whatever reason, I'll, I'll ch- try and dial something different in with the HX DOM. Um but yeah, it's the same thing, man. Like you rock up to the gig, you do the gig, uh, you go home. My guitar's the same. Like my, it's it used to be when I played my Cole Clark acoustic for all the gigs, it never ever came out of the case because like I'm staring at my Guild um, acoustic yeah. right now, and I've got several other like really nice acoustics. Um, the Cole Clark is just a tool. Like it's my work, it's my work device. Yeah. Um, and now it's it sort of is like that with my. Um, Charvel and my Isabel Telly because they both serve different purposes. One is to do the Dockers, uh, and one is to do all the other cover gigs. Um, my Axe Effects, my AX8, sorry, um, I still take that for the Dockers uh, gigs. It literally never comes out of its like its laptop case, which is what it has lived in for the last like six years. Never comes out unless I've got to, like do that one gig. Um, but it, all this stuff, I'm still in this trap, this constant trap of like, okay, A, looking at gear, but just the thought of like, yeah, it can do cool stuff. Like, what more cool stuff can I do? How much time do I want to waste? Like, that's why the, like the Morningstar and the way that whole rig works is, um, is really cool. Like, from the, the tech nerd side of it, I'm really happy with how that's all come together. Uh, there's still more stuff that could happen. Because, like, man, I could hypothetically, like, we've got the same Behringer digital mixer, with ha- yeah, which yeah. has MIDI in. I could control that with a foot pedal if I wanted to. Yep. And I've thought about doing that with a witty jack because it's it might just be channel on and off or reverb on and off on a vocal. Like, you can do anything you want. It's just- Yeah, um, I think there's a thing now where people have always thought of these things. How cool would it be to do A, B, C, or D? Mm-hmm. And when the actual ceiling, like the price ceiling comes way down on that, it's like, well, yeah, witty jack's not expensive, I'll just get one yep. and then I've got more stuff that I can do. Whereas, you know, that's a bit cheaper than paying a sound guy to run your desk for yep. every single gig. So, yeah, I think part of it, it's interesting. I feel like we're untangling this. <laughs> we've we've really gone off topic, like, but it's a cool, I think it's a cool topic, but go on. Yeah, sorry. yeah. You know, it's sort of, you, you, you're within striking distance of all these ideas. So, it's, it's actually, I'm going to argue that it is creative, but, but sometimes- the flexing that creativity ends up, you end up just flexing it purely on like signal chain and routing and, you know, sound design rather than music. Yep. And that always gets thrown around as a criticism. But, you know, we should be focusing on making more music. Why? No one values music anymore. Mm-hmm. I think what people really want to do is they want the satisfaction of doing something creative with their life. And the only thing they know how to do is how to play music. Uh, and- this is going to be a conundrum for the entire planet uh, when, you know, AI replaces heaps of jobs. What are you going to do with yourself? Yep. You don't have any creative outlet anymore. You may have said you hate your job, but, you know, 
it was keeping you busy and it, you had to do creative things. You had to solve problems. Like that's, there's something so fundamentally human about, ah, oh, here's a little game. Ah, oh, <laughs> there's like an issue in the game. You know, that's sort of just, that's what I like about music anyway. Uh, it'd be really, really sad if there was no more people making music anymore. But, you know, really the the core, the kernel of truth in there is that like I like, like creativity is kind of good. For being a person, you can do too much of it. You can get carried away with it. You can like lionize it too much. But, you know, it's why like Charles has set up a couple of weeks ago, you know, it's a ni- it was a nice balance between I've got a job to do mm-hmm. and I've got cool stuff. But then the cool stuff is organized in a way that I can do the job. Yep. And the job lets me play with the cool stuff sometimes. So, that was, that was as balanced as I've seen any gear hoarder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think for me, I I find a lot more enjoyment in the the like less in the playing of music. It's what something I need to just accept. Like, because I, I can play music, I can do a gig, and I can get paid for it. And it's more interesting to work out how to make things switch together and work together. Because I mean, to do like the gigs that you and I do, like if it's a cover thing, it's you can literally you can do it in your sleep. Like, after, it's been. I don't know, thousand plus gigs over the years. And some, you know, you play the same couple of songs every night. Um, it's, it's fine. It's, but it's a, like, that's a job. Whereas, yeah, the, the creative, the creative part of that for me is not in the playing. It's in the, yeah, it's in the technical sort of stuff. So it's just sort of interesting to, for me, to, to put all that together. And, and so that's when, that's why I'm, I guess I'm still happy to spend the money on it, even though it's not that financially responsible. Yeah. Sometimes. But you do run up to the like the moral and value judgment of if the only thing of worth in the music industry is the making of music. And you're like, how many people really do this? You know? And then the making of music, oh, cool, <laughs> bro. I got some like, you know, get good drums and Euro bass and a neural DSP preset. And I went 0101 in a different order. <laughs> like, awesome. If that's what gets you off, do it. But it's not a, you know, there's no hierarchy of morality between that and plugging a pedal board in or plugging an out of tune squire into a big sky and just making dream pop because that's what you want to do. So, uh, you know, it's, (laughs) we make problems for ourselves really, really easy with some of this stuff. So whether, and you know, yeah, I think the big refinement we're bringing it around, mate. We're coming back in. We're bringing the tide back around. You know, the refinement that has been made to the way we can make the electronic part of the guitar sound has, that's where all the innovation has really happened. You know, like I feel like you got composite materials with Steinberger and Parker. Mm-hmm. There's literally been nothing new. doesn't mean there hasn't been cool stuff, but if you're just looking for novelty and you're looking for new ways of doing stuff, um, you know, like <laughs> you got to like cut down a tree to make a guitar, mm. basically, and you have to like use a bunch of petrochemicals to make the plastics to put on it. Um, that's obviously now a concern that is in the mainstream consciousness of people. Like, well, how much of the how much more of the environment do we want to destroy? Uh, playing devil's advocate, I would say, like, well. <laughs> Your little guitar hobby probably isn't the problem. It's probably the, you know, gigantic multinational corporations that are doing it. Uh, easy, easy cop out though. So, yeah, I can understand that like even, you know, you make the coffee analogy is, you know, like for my parent, for our parents' generation, coffee was just, you just go and get a bit of an Nescafe and put it in a cup and you feel less tired at the end. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know- for me, it's oh, it's and it's a single origin from Ethiopia. This region, traceable, trackable. The small farmer gets X percentage. The distribute, you know, it's like there's this transparency there where, you know, you you're sipping the cup, enjoying it, and you're telling yourself you're enjoying it more because you're like conscious of the pro the industrial process behind it or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't feel like that with guitar. I don't care. <laughs> I just p- want to play it. Like, that's a different thing. But I get that for other people, that's also like, you know, playing a guitar that's not made of wood or, you know, that's like not made in a Southeast Asian 
factory where the workers are making minimum wage, maybe the people are actually getting paid better or something like that, you know, they're, they're things that map onto the personality traits of somebody who's a musician because you're probably a little bit, you know, you spend a lot of time worrying about how you're going to feel and your audience is going to feel. So, why not the whole kind of signal chain? Man, we're so off and it's so awesome. Yes. Uh, hopefully, people uh, have <laughs> stuck around. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's um, yeah. I'm trying to think of how I can bring it back on into, onto topic, other than just to say. So, I so just need to I, shut the fuck sorry. Up. My point was going to be that you can have refinements. You can still just Fender can still make a Telecaster, you know. Yeah. But the refinement doesn't necessarily have to be in the design. It can be in all the other things. Okay. And you know, the, there's right. I there's been, you, now. you know, like. <laughs> In, like the way industrial processes happen now has changed massively from the 50s as well. And I guess that's why you have a boutique guitar market because industrial processes get more efficient and new, you know, why would we use this nitrocellulose lacquer that goes off and we can have this, you know, poly finish or something like that or, you know, we can, we can have CNC. Uh, and so people are like, well, I liked it when it was a handmade guitar. So... These other, the as the as the autom automated part of it becomes more and more uh, taken care of, then you get these cottage industries spin out of it, where it's like, oh, we're going to make it on a small scale, but like they did in the fifties. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big part of the guitar market. Same thing with amps, you know. Um, like talking to Santiago last week, where it's, you know, part of his job was design the amp but another part was design the amp to meet spec mm. and you know emissions and things like that which were just not a thing in the 60s and 70s and now they are so yeah it's it it's maybe a little bit uncomfortable realizing that like the the hobby that we love so much is embedded so deeply into like these big global processes that happen you're just like, it's a guitar, you know, that company makes it. And I identify with the values of the company mm -hmm. when the reality doesn't match that at all. So, yeah, maybe there's like refinement there as well. Or it, maybe that's a really good argument to buy old guitars and do them up. Yeah. I mean, from a, oh, mate, I, I actually have no basis in, no, this is the truth, but I, I kind of have this feeling that PRS as a company seems like okay. Um, Again, I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but the fact that you've got so many guys that are there that have been there for like 20 something years, it seems like at the very least, it's probably an okay place to work. And Paul is obviously very passionate and there's like- Well, the they took out a really big loan during the pandemic so they could pay their workers. Like they didn't lay off their staff mm. unpaid. They they paid them throughout the lockdowns and stuff like that. Yep. Um, and whether- a lot of other companies did that and just didn't advertise it or mm -hmm. whether the PRS just kind of did it and you know, they had access to it. But I remember that happening and being like, okay, there's still some human beings working here. Yep. You're not just, you know, a bunch of ants in a factory churning out these things so that you can meet some global hedge funds bottom line. Well, even like I, I remember watching a thing of Paul talking about the um, SE guitars and he's like, yeah, you know, we had these made in, is it World Music in Korea that did them? Yeah. Or does them? I think, I think Cortec make them now. Right. Well, anyway, he was like, we, we put these guitars out and, you know, other companies were doing it and they were hiding the fact that it was all made international, da, da, da. But we were like, you know, like they're good instruments and you guys deserve to be recognized. So, we're going to put it on the back of the headstock to say, this is where it's made and you should be proud of it. And we're proud of it. And it's like, that's kind of a, you know, that, that has like actual- uh, that has ramifications for like the culture around consumption with musical instruments, yeah. you know, because man, how many Facebook groups have you been in over the years, which are like a bunch of dudes talking about how awesome, you know, super strats that were made in America are and American cars. And, you know, by the way, it's Friday. So here's some girl with the tits out, you know, <laughs> like that's- <laughs> Yeah, awesome, bro. Like, mm -hmm. you know, this is just a- it's fun for some people if that's that's what you like. But also, that's that- to me, that is that like stagnant- I don't actually really like music. I don't actually really like guitar. 
I'm just a bit lonely. I want to hang out with my mates kind of thing, <laughs> which is okay. You know, nothing wrong with that. But, you know, then going on these rants about, oh, the made in, made in China or made in Korea and, you know, whatever. It's, um, yeah. what is that? Economic nationalism that I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, yep. it's, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing, um, but you really, really see it really hard with guitars. Yeah. I mean, I've- I've said to you, and I've said to a lot of people recently, my Mexican-made guitars are the ones that I play the most. You know, my Charvel and my Isabel Telly, both made in Mexico. My other, um, uh, like, Blontelli, made in Mexico. They're amazing instruments. They play guitars. They feel great. They sound great. It's like, why would you spend so much more money to, to get a made in USA guitar that, man, like, so the comparison between some of the American tellies that I played and the, um, like, the Mexican ones have been very unfavorable. You know, because I mean, what's the difference? Labor, mm. like, what's the biggest cost for Fender or Gibson? It's labor, you know. So that's why we pay so little for consumer goods is because you can take the most expensive part of the process and make it way less expensive by offshoring it. Um, and you know, <laughs> again not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It's like a complicated thing. It creates, you know, like it's that's globalization. And it kind of looks like there's this coming ensuing retreat from globalization, um, especially with, you know, I'm not very savvy to all the reforms they're trying to make, especially like in the States. But, you know, if you look at um, microprocessors and stuff like that, you know, trying to get some of that stuff made in the States because it's a national security interest as well. And right. there's that like, it's economic nationalism and it's uh, there's the security aspect of it and there's a bunch of other stuff going on. So, you know, yeah, what happens when you start, if, if you're able to, you know, have way more semiconductors made in the US, like what does that do outside of just the price? You obviously need a lot of experts to work on something like that. Like with guitars, you even though it's a lo much more automated process, you know, you s like guitars don't set themselves up out of the factory. Mm. Um, you still so, need someone to operate a plec. <laughs> yeah, you still need someone to operate the plec, plec and operate the CNC. And that expertise, you know, um, if you bring it, if that's taking place, you know, in the country of origin, then again, like, do you get more John Sirs eventually? But instead of, or like, you know, the, if you had people who were working for Gibson in the 70s who left and did their own thing, they'd have a different skill set to someone working there now who might just operate the CNC. They may not have the full picture. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was another thing I remember reading about PRS where, like, if you start working there, you start in one division, but you eventually work everywhere. Right. So, if you've been there long enough, you probably know how to make a guitar, yeah. which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, who was- is it Nags that came out of PRS? Yes, I think Joe Nags was there. He did the private stock thing for a while, and right. like the mirror was his design, and okay. yeah, does the Nags thing now. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I, I still have that thing with PRS where, as I said, it just, it, uh, like some of the some of the guitars that come out, and they're so fancy and they're just so nice, and that's just like not what I like about guitars. Yeah, but then there's just like you know, I, I can't. I can't really be that stupid and be like, you know, knock the refinement of the instrument and knock the like at the work atmosphere that seems to be like reasonable. And him as a, a boss seems kind of reasonable. I've never, I don't know anything to the truth or, yeah, yeah, or not of that. It's on the, at least on the surface, it seems like fairly ethical. So, you know, got to give him props for that. So, like, really complaining. But also, it is, it is an aesthetic thing. Like, you know, you're wearing a leather jacket and jeans. I like, sure am. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> like James Dean, bro. Like that's why that's popular. Yeah. Um, a butterscotch Telecaster or a Sunburst Les Paul is, you know, yeah. that like the, I guess the trends in consumer goods at the time were as they were. And they're so, you have this like nexus of things, mm -hmm. which it is iconic, you know? Man, as and, an, I've, I'm really coming around to my own hypocrisy over the course of this discussion, the like the conservative guitar player and the like hating of conservative guitars. It's just yeah, yeah. the uh, dichotomy of that. I'm um, just like, just shut but the fuck up, Troy. 
<laughs> but but it's that te- like you know the the idea is that like if you understand the hypocrisy, then that's the the tension is the thing that is that's where your desire to do stuff comes from. You know um, that push and pull between I want this, but uh you know I don't want it to be exactly the way it was when it was made like that, but I still want it to kind of be that. So um, you know that's I guess why Fender have custom shops and why there's there is space for other ideas in there and mm. i think you know the cool thing about <laughs> the cool thing about it being different is like yeah you can listen to a plenty record and know that he's probably playing a digital modeler and a strandberg and that's something that he could literally put in his backpack and go and do a gig anywhere and sound the same but there's still that space for like i plug a les paul into a marshall full stack and I need a truck to drive my rig around mm. and I'm prepared to do it. Like there's just, it's less one thing. It's like the trends don't get replaced now. They just get embellished. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Having said that, could you could you ever gig with a strap? <laughs> I've, ne- I've still ne- never played one, so maybe. I think you probably could. You, you already played with that um, Harley Benton one, right? The um, I got that headless a, Harley, yeah, headless. which is a, a shameless Strandberg ripoff. It's a really good guitar, you know. Yeah, I tried the um, the Ibanez ones, whatever those ones are. They they didn't really feel. Oh, uh, the Ibanez headless, yeah, yeah. It was, it's just not my thing, you know. Again, like here I am. I'm just complaining about innovation and like not enjoying the innovation. So it's silly. Um, I think like. As I was saying all that stuff, the the thing that um, came to mind is like, yeah, the the uh, interconnectivity with electronic music is probably just in terms of a space that I'd like to explore or like more companies to explore. Like that's what it is. You get a little yeah. bit of it with MIDI guitars or the Fishman pickup. That that what's that one called? The you had that for a bit. The MIDI thing. Uh, the triple play. Yeah. Triple play. Yeah. Like those things are those things are cool, but it's like um, the more. I would like to see that and more people just keep pushing that side of it because um, maybe I'm just ultimately over rock guitar. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, like just I love the sound of, of vintage synthesizers, but there, there really is, you know, the Roland GK stuff is pretty good and the triple play is pretty good, but it's not like playing a keyboard, mm. you know, and it's not like playing a guitar. It'd be... That feels like kind of one of the final frontiers where it's like, how could you get a guitar, which is the thing you and I grew up playing, that's the that's the muscle memory that's baked yeah. into us. How can I get more mileage out of those existing skills and just get access to a whole new suite of sounds? Because I love those sounds. Yeah, that's you know? what I've been- um, I'm always looking out when I- uh, like the, the boss thing that was it the, S, the SY, 200, yes. and 600 or whatever, 500. Like when um, all that stuff came out, like that seems really cool. That um, that human um, human computer interface, um, or yeah, the fisherman pickup, as I said, because like I'd love to in- be able to incorporate that into m- the gigs. That would make me like tick off the technical satisfaction, um, but also make it slightly more creative because it's just not the same guitar sounds all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm you know I- I've said before, like all the stuff with me and speakers, I'm still working out elements of that. <laughs> But that's different. Like that's a that's more of a recording studio and a um, uh, trying to like work on other people's stuff and and get that sounding better. Whereas like just me and my own creativity is is sort of maybe slightly different, uh, or my interests are slightly different. So it's interesting to think the way something like a guitar cuts across genres and other things humans like to categorize themselves into. You know, belief systems and uh, political views and taste in music and aesthetics and things like that, it really does just feel like kind of a fork or something, you know? doesn't matter what you believe. Heaps of people will eat food with a fork <laughs> <laughs> or they'll use like, you know, they'll use a bowl or a plate. Um, talking about guitar in this way, it sort of feels like that where mm. it's like, you know, there are, oh man, this fork with the four prongs, bro, that is like the way the, like the ellipse that they've traced out, you know, I'm, I'm, sh- I'm sure there are people, well, hey, you know, all those things you have in your home, someone had to design them, right? Yep. And uh, if you don't notice them, then maybe that's good design. So, uh, yeah, that's, it, it, it seems like such a more utilitarian kind of tool or, <laughs> you know, falling, at least we're not audiophiles, Troy. Oh, yeah. I mean, 
thank God for that. Um, I'm I'm very over. Um, I mean, analog recording gear at all at the moment. It's um, it's kind of just the the way. This is a completely different topic, but yeah, the way that I work. I feel like I've just rearranged my racks to remove a bunch of compressors that were there just because they looked cool, yeah. not because they served a function. And it's sort of, you know, well, I sent you the picture of it, but having moved a rack out, now there's actual space in this in this control room that I didn't have before and it's actually comfortable. It's like, man, I, I can, I was looking at, um, again, slightly off topic, but um, that new um, SSL controller that came out, you know, the one fader one. Did you say that? Yes. Yep. Yeah. I, um, I actually went and- uh, I didn't demo it, but I, I went and looked at it at the music shop today. Um, that versus the dock, the Avid dock thing, because they're about similar price and do similar sort of things. Um, but yeah, that like the whole way that I work now uh, and that I've been like the trajectory of that over the last couple of years has been to eliminate a lot of analog gear and just do as much stuff with the computer and as few other things in front of me as possible. So, I mean, all these extra controls and stuff are almost irrelevant, but having one fader to be able to move up and down to do rides would be really useful. Yeah, um, yeah. I kind of feel the same thing, though. It's like when, you know, I like playing with gear. It's yep. my hobby. But when I want to work, the less stuff in front of me, the better. You know, just like I'll, I will clean my desk before I do any recording. You right. know, I'm like one of those kind of people where it's like, no distractions, please. Just if I've got a tuner and a guitar plugged into something, then I can I can do what I need to do. So, again, I feel like that's just a skill set that, you know, you develop over time. And then when you click into that mental space, that's where, that's where the kind of I can do the job with the minimal stuff kicks in. But the rest of the time, you kind of want to have fun. So, stuff's kind of fun. Yep. Um, not right now, but we should, I want to talk to you about, um, the, the human interface when it comes to dialing guitar sounds. Oh yeah. Not the human interface, okay. the, the interface between human and guitar sound. Um, I think it might be a cool topic that we can talk about another time. Like I'll just preface it by saying, so I have right on my desk here. I might, might be able to lift it up. It might be a bit small, but I've got this stream deck. Oh, the stream plus, deck. Yep. Um, I was showing Charles one the other day. This is one that has the knobs on it, and this does my monitor controller for the um, uh, for my Avid Matrix Studio interface over there. But um, it has four knobs on it, and it, and it has eight buttons, and then it has a few other little tricks and stuff it can do if you don't use it with Soundflow, if you just use it as a normal thing. So when it first came out, I was like, well, that's cool because you can make the buttons do whatever you want. What are some things you could do with these buttons? Because if you buy a... Um, like a MIDI uh, Huey controller or something like that, where it has set buttons on it. I mean, that's a set buttons and knobs. Um, the labeling of those knobs is always a bit kind of funky, but this, because it's like, each yeah, button yeah, right. Is a little easy to see. I'm like, well, you could do some cool stuff with it. So I was thinking like, right, hypothetically, again, one example, you have a distressor, right? This has four knobs on it. Distressor has four knobs. So you're hypothetically, uh -huh, you can yep, map yep. the knobs to a distressor and make the buttons do the various things on that. So there's one thing. But then trying to think about it in other ways, like guitar plugins. So, uh -huh. you know, mapping it to your bass, middle, treble gain um, on the four knobs or, or other elements of it. Um, but then also extending it to the axe effects because yep. same sort of thing. Like you could, it'd be great to be able to dial those knobs on, uh, like knobs in. Um, but then I also got thinking of like, I have, okay, your FM3 that's on the ground. Mm -hmm. I don't like using the knobs on that because yeah, I prefer to use the screen. Lean down it. Yeah. Well, yep. yeah, there's, but I could put it on the desk and do it, but then like- Then you can't step on the buttons. Yeah. But, but still it's kind of like, then I'm dialing a, a thing in on the screen, like on the little screen, whereas the FM3 software and the Axis FX8 and the same sort of, like all these things, I much prefer doing that on the screen. But then the interface, I'm like talking about adding buttons to something that already has buttons, but I don't like where the buttons are. It's, you know what I mean? It's just like really silly. So yeah, yeah the um, the actual way of dialing in sounds, like we should we should have a little extended chat about that another time, um, because this is probably already like long enough. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it might um, be cool to find like you know track down a guest who's got some experience designing well, these things or something like that. Yeah, so like if anybody's listening and they want to they want to suggest some names we can reach out to, I would love that. Yeah, like you've mentioned the um, Line 6 
um, or the Helix or whatever that interface being like really like pretty schmicko, like pretty streamlined, yeah. pretty accessible, which I absolutely agree with. Um, and there's other there's other pieces of gear that are certainly not the same level. There was something I, I came across the other day that was really bothering me. It wasn't the FM3. It was like there was another piece of gear that I was trying to get to work with just the knobs and buttons on the thing. And uh-huh. It just drove me nuts. I, again, I can't remember what, which one it was. But um, yeah, it's just like, uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be cool to have a chat to someone like that. Um, but maybe... Maybe it was Santiago. <laughs> we call, have a chat to yeah, him again, yeah. uh, and he might. That was so he, good. He, he might know. So, anyway, I'll just um, let me wrap up my thing, saying like I have had a crisis of faith. Maybe Paul Reed Smith's not so bad. Maybe I seem to fucking get over myself, um, and uh, I'll leave it there from from Uncle yeah. Troy. I will. Uh, I will just surmise that uh, we're all doomed in the coming AI apocalypse, and in the meantime, let's just enjoy our time on Earth. So. This has been another episode of the Gear Podcast, Troy. Thank you for joining us and we will see you all next week. Peace.